Hello friends, in this video we will have a discussion on the editorials that appeared in the Hindu newspaper related to the subject area of science and technology. In this first video we will have a discussion on January 1 editorial with a topic for a wider pool clinical trials and the burden of volunteering for them. Clinical trials are based on the concept of volunteerism that benefits science and the society. This nature of volunteerism to the clinical trials takes a wrong turn when only certain sections of the society participates that puts their life at danger and also the benefits that does not reach the society. It is this aspect is well brought out in this article. So the editorial it brings the issue about volunteerism for clinical trials and what it finds is that the socio-economic status of volunteers, their nature to volunteer to the clinical trials, the risks involved and the need to address the issue. What are clinical trials? According to Drugs and Cosmetics Act 1940, we can find the definition for this term clinical trials. Clinical trials relates to drugs and cosmetics and it involves a systematic study about the safety, efficacy, performance or tolerance of these substances. Any clinical trials has to register with the drug controlling authority and has to register in national clinical trials registry. The article begins that more regulation is needed to ensure a truly ethical clinical research. But contrasting this viewpoint Clinical research organizations argues that more regulation constricts the freedom to conduct the clinical researches and hence it will stifle the industry. So it always presents an ethical dilemma whether more regulation is required to bring ethical features into these researches or it, it requires freedom so that these researches can be conducted with free hand. This editorial presents a view for this very dilemma question. So what is the big problem in a clinical trials? As we mentioned earlier, clinical trials are characterized by volunteerism. But not everybody volunteers for these clinical trials. According to this article, there is a over representation of economically weaker sections. Low income groups among the trial subjects. But why this over representation of weaker sections of the society participates in the clinical trials for two reasons. One, they are selectively recruited. The low income groups are selectively recruited by clinical research organizations as a means of exploitation using financial incentives. And they are also medically ignorant. So because of their financial incentives and medical ignorance, they are selectively recruited by CROs. But this is not only one side of the uh, aspect. The other side of the coin is that the volunteer themselves over volunteer for the sake of money. So, but this over representation, why it particularly occurs with the poor? The clinical trials can be conducted for various levels of drug research. The over representation of the poor is most often found in bioequivalent studies. What a bioequivalence means? Two drugs that can have similar bioactive substances need to have the same absorption, same activity and same metabolism. A study to compare these features is called as bioequivalent studies. Very often bioequivalent studies are conducted to study the efficacy of generic drugs in a healthy subject. So these bioequivalent studies is where the poor are very much over represented. Why? Because these poor subjects are well paid but at the same time they get no therapeutic benefit. They are healthy subjects, they do not have any disease but despite they are selected purely for these researches and hence they do not get any medical benefits. And the only reward they get by participating in the clinical trials is pure financial incentives. So because there is no medical benefit, 
the very incentive to participate rest only on the ground of money. This leads to lie about medical records or they enroll in they enroll or participate in multiple such clinical trials to increase their income because as we mentioned earlier the only incentive is towards the money and hence either they lie about their medical records or they enroll in multiple clinical trials. But what this is going to bring? What are the potential impacts of such over representation? As we said earlier these deceptions, these deceptions means their nature to lie, various clinical trials and the only incentive is towards the money. It is a risk to the volunteer because they are subjecting their health to untested drugs. So it is a risk to volunteer and also society at large as well. Because of this non-scientific selection of volunteers, it will very much deviate the trials results. So this deviation of the trials results very much destroys the core objective of conducting clinical trials. In general, when clinical trial data is fudged by the clinical research organization CROs, it can be easily found out. To cite some examples, Ranbaxy case of 2004 and GVK Biosciences in 2015 is some to cite. While such fudging of clinical trial data can be easily found out by health regulatory bodies, this volunteer deception, that inclination to lie is very hard to identify and hence this naturally deviates the test results and hence the benefits of the clinical trials does not reach its natural end. So the editorial continues, why this unscientific data is dangerous? Because of such clinical trials conducted based on non-scientific selection of subjects, it will result in unsafe drugs entering the market. Unsafe drugs due to such non-scientific clinical trials conducted. So unsafe drugs can make their way into the market plus safe drugs also can get rejected. So the editorial tries to bring some solutions. What could be the way out? There could be three possible solutions for this conundrum. Solution one. First, the very aim of this article is how to prevent the over volunteerism of poor people. So why they over want to volunteer? Because of financial incentives. And they tend to lie about their medical records and they participate in multiple clinical trials at the same time. Editorial wants to strike there. How? It aims, to, it recommends for the creation of national registry of trial volunteers. So this national registry of trial volunteers will have a complete list including the medical records of all the test subjects which will alert the CRO, clinical research organization when someone signs up for two studies simultaneously. So signing up for two clinical trials simultaneously can be prevented by this registry. But how this can possible without eroding the privacy of the test subjects? So this national registry, even though it prevents the over representation, at the same time it will, it, it is a violation of a patient's secrecy. So what is needed, if this system is to be followed, it has to be ensured that it is a system that does not compromises each participant's data. So it is also one recommendary measure, but not really live up to the expectations. So what would be the next one? Let's move. Solution 2. The main motive of the participants is towards the financial incentives. Let's reduce the financial incentives when they participate in the clinical trials. That is the second incentive, to pay the volunteers less. But this also has a ripple effect. So when the financial incentives are taken away, we are very much hitting that, in, that inclination to participate in this clinical trials and hence this step may reduce trial participation dramatically. Even though it in a way reduces over representation, it will hamper 
the availability of subjects to these clinical trials due to low financial available incentive. So this may not also be a preferred alternative. Let's go to the solution three and the most plausible solution among the three. <coughs> what could be the sustainable solution? The real issue here is not the over representation of poor. The real issue here is why the rest of the society does not participate in the clinical trials. The benefit of the clinical trials reaches all strata of the society, but the clinical trial itself includes only the poor. So that is what lies in the solution three. So a more sustainable solution is to encourage a wider section of society to participate in these clinical trials. Why? The society has to realize that the, the valuable outputs that clinical research gives by making the drugs safer, by making the drugs more uh, effective. So society must realize that clinical trials is for the society, is for the benefit of the society and hence society at large must participate, not only the poor. The burden of volunteering should not fall only on the vulnerable groups, here in this case the poor sections of the society. The existing selectiveness in recruiting subjects for the clinical trials is one of the main reasons that leads to human rights violations. So the selectiveness of subject recruitment is a reason for both human rights violations but also leads to bad signs. It leads to bad signs because there is nothing substantial that can come out of such non-scientific clinical trials. So the educated, the affluent, who are usually known to have greater access to these drugs, the drugs which comes out of the clinical research must understand the criticality of this subject and hence they should be well engaging to participate in, in these clinical trials. And not but not the least, only an aware, a vigilant civil society is required so that the, the fruits of clinical research is reaching this all on ethical grounds. In this short video, we will have a discussion on January 3 editorial with the title Towards a Genomics Revolution that featured in The Hindu. The field of genomics had its humble beginning with the discovery of law of inheritance by Gregor Mendel in 1865, who is considered as a father of genetics. And later, it was argumented by the understanding the DNA structure by James and Watson, James Watson in 1953. It is these two monumental discoveries in the field of science which enabled the growth of personalized medicine. It is this personalized medicine, the focus of this present topic and how is it going to have an impact in the Indian populations. So what is a personalized medicine first? Conventionally, in a more traditional way, one drug is synthesized and it is given evenly to all the population even though not each one are same. Even though the persons are different, the same medicine is given to all the persons. This is how conventionally treatment is provided. Contrasting this, personalized medicine is a move away from one size fits all approach towards individualization, tailoring of medical treatment according to the individual needs and preferences of each patient. So the treatment given to one person will not be the same to another person, will not be the same to another person. So this is what personalized medicine is and this application called as personalized medicine requires a one important fundamental data, the genome of each individual. Only by understanding the genome of each individual, these treatments can be tailor made and specifically designed for each individual. The prospect of personalized medicine, it fundamentally depends on the precise information stored in each person's DNA. It is precisely stored in each one's genome. In 1953, when the structure of DNA was discovered, 
by Watson and Crick. That is what put the fundamental framework for the present studies that happens in our genomics. But in 1953, the technology was not existing to sequence the whole genome. But in 1990, there was, a ambish, there was an ambitious project to sequence the whole genome of humans, which was completed subsequently in 2001. So by 2001, the whole human genome as a reference data was available to the humankind. This opened the Pandora's box and it also opened the availability of personalized medicine. So what was impossible before 60 years with the growth of technology and its advancement, it is now a reality. And over the period of time, the cost of sequencing individual genomes is also falling very much. And as of now, on an average, it costs just $1000 to sequence my genome or your genome. So this potential possibility of sequencing individual genome gives rise to the age of personalized medicine. So with the present acceleration in this area, it is very real, it is very possible that the personalized medicine is in a very near future. Not just sequencing genome will help in personalized medicine, there are other potential developments also in this field such as the recent hot topic CRISPR, clustered regularly interspersed short palindromic repeats, which is a, a potent tool for gene editing. So the whole genome sequencing coupled with CRISPR technology, gene based interventions is a very possibility in the present time. So in this context, what is India's position? So if India need to capitalize the benefit of the personalized medicine, there are certain prerequisites. The prerequisite is the same as what is required for a personalized medicine, the whole genome sequence. So if India need to fully utilize the benefit of this technological revolution, the whole genome sequence of our Indian population should be available. So it is in this regard that India need to conduct a sustained and a dedicated longitudinal study on genome variations of its populations. So only by studying the genome variations of the populations and the suitable training of the manpower and the human resources that this data can be scaled up for the personalized medicine. Only this will help India to climb up the ladder of genomic revolution that is in the trending. So what will be the, why such a survey is needed or why this, what would be the possible outcomes of this study? Let's have some look on this. So such a study will help us to link between the physical diseases and its correlation with the genomic data. So by having the whole genome of the populations and the diseases manifested in them, we can make a clear correlation between the physical manifestation of the diseases and the genome of the individual. The ideal nature of such a project should be to sequence the whole genome of our entire population. If it is not practically possible, at least the database of a genomic data of a million people is at least a good start. If not the entire population, at least a database that contains genomics of genome data of at least a million people is a good start. And we should, on, we should not be a late starter in this field because already in China, Cardori Biobank has already started collecting genomic data and storing it in a database since 2004 till up to 2008. So we should catch up with the race and, and make use of the genetic diversity that is available in our country. With nearly 5000 ethno-linguistic and religious groups, India being such a diverse country, it can contribute a one important advantage that no other country can enjoy. That each of these ethno-linguistic and religious groups, they are genetically distinct. One community, one caste group is genetically distinct compared to another group. This genetic distinctiveness is a very important 
an advantageous platform to build upon further on this personalized medicine. So this genetic distinctiveness, which we said earlier, what could be the reason for this genetic distinctiveness? In Indian culture, in Indian tradition, there is usually a practice of endogamy. Endogamy is a tradition of having marriage within the caste, community or the tribes. So the genes which are present in the community don't mix with the rest of the other communities. So the genomic data of this community groups are very closely held. And what is the genetic feature of a one community group may not be present in another. So this is what the scientific basis of evaluating and understanding community groups based on the genomic data. So the conventional view or the very commonly we think caste lies only in the mind which is very wrong. And in fact scientifically caste it may lie in the mind but it also lies in the genomics. It, it also lies in the genes. It also lies in the genetic distinctiveness. So this genetic distinctiveness of, of one group is a potent information. One community may be suffering from one particular genetic disease which others may not. So this information will help us to understand the recessive diseases, genetic diseases that are specific to certain individuals, that are specific to certain community groups. This specific genetic diseases restricted to a certain community groups can be very easily identified by such a survey. So after developing this knowledge about the genomic data of community groups and linking with the diseases, what would be the application of such data? It can help in managing these diseases effectively and it also can help us to genetically counsel which will help in reducing the incidence in the future generations. Is it something very innovative and never tried before? No. Already Ashkenazi Jews have used the very same methodology to eliminate a genetic disease called the Stay-Sachs disease which is a nervous syndrome from their population. So this is a very valid and also it has been tested tool to understand the genetic propensity of our communities and their associated diseases. So this genome wide association studies of different communities can also be used to identify genetic risk factors related to not only uh, genetic diseases but also of other diseases such as obesity, diabetes. So this Indian genetic diversity study will be an important asset if done in a very sustainable manner. So what would be the potential applications of such a data set? This using this data we can understand the genes, their interactions and their functions. It also will help the humanity as well. It also offers India to have its rightful position in the global medical and scientific frontier. It also helps in establishing viable commercial enterprises due to valuable products that emerges out of the study. So what about the present status in India? What needed to be done? In India, in the, in the context of uh, genome sequencing, that is one private sector that exists, only one private sector that exists to sequence whole genome. So right now, even though the potential exists, we have not fully stood up to the challenge. So it is rather a slow progress and hence there is a lot more ground to cover. So what is required? We require manpower to handle the immense challenges in the field of medical and research activities, which at present is not adequate. And this requires a coherent push at the national level by all the stakeholders, the stakeholders here being the government, the academic institutions, the private sector, the medical research institutions and the civil society as well. It requires a coherent push at the national level by all the stakeholders. So this coherent push, in what direction it has to be or what would be credible steps we can take towards this end. We need to set up an Indian genetic data bank. The data bank created out of 
the personal genome sequencing carried out to individual caste groups. So after sequencing these caste groups, that database should be included in this Indian Genetic Data Bank. Second, we have to promote academic programs to argument our human resources, which helps to train scientists, technicians, and doctors. Because it is a very gray area, it also, we also need to put in place a strong regulatory framework, which with the broad objectives for both public as well as private sector, which is not self-defeating. Self-defeating is that in the name of regulation that this field should not be crippled or restricted. If not acted in time, the valuable genetic information that each of our community in our country has will be easily lost to the neighboring countries such as Singapore. Why we particularly mention about Singapore is because Singapore right now is in the process of creating such a genome database for the Asian populations with India is a part. Unless India acts in time, it also results in migration of the Indians and their participation in the Singapore studies. And this will create once again a dependency for such data sets for other countries. So unless India acts in time, it will create a cycle of dependency for this valuable genetic information about our communities, about our caste on the other nations. And it is a right time for India considering its present economic growth and the present awareness that right now exists among the society. It is a right time for India to begin its own genomics revolution. And what is needed is a vision and leadership at the national level to leverage this opportunity at the right moment to bring a genomics revolution. Hello friends, welcome back to our online video session and in the short video we will have a discussion in the editorial expanding the donor pool which featured in the year 2018 January 7 in the Hindu. In this editorial it is a response towards a recent development that occurred in India and how this recent researches in stem cell technology will help in improving the availability of donors for the stem cells. So, in general, this is an article about recent development in the stem cell technology, which can be used for transplantation of bone marrows and how it is a very potential development so that it can help in selecting even aged stem cells for such transplantation studies. Before we venture into this, let's briefly see what a stem cell is. A stem cell is an unspecialized cell with no functions but has the ability of cell division and when they divide it has the ability to develop into specialized cells and also the ability to self replicate. Among the various types of stem cells, one particular stem cell called a hematopoietic stem cell because this editorial deals with hematopoietic stem cell. What hematopoietic stem cells are? Why we are discussing about hematopoietic stem cells? Hematopoietic stem cell is what the topic of discussion in this editorial and hematopoietic stem cell is a blood stem cell which is found in the bone marrows and responsible for the formation of all cells of the blood which includes red blood cells, platelets and white blood cells. All the cells of the blood arises only from hematopoietic stem cell. And the hematopoietic stem cell usually resides in the bone marrow. What a bone marrow is? Bone marrow is a spongy tissue located at the head like structure in the bones. And bone marrow is usually found in large sized bones, in longer bones. So such a bone marrow is required to be transplanted in certain diseased conditions. Because the bone marrow is producing diseased stem cells which in turn producing deceased blood cells. So that requires a bone marrow transplant. So what a, what a bone marrow transplant is? It is a procedure that replaces faulty bone marrow with a healthy one donated by a donor. But this is not like cutting the head of the bone and replacing it as it is not done in that way. But rather the recipient, the deceased one is exposed to very high energy radiations where the bone, where the long bones are located, 
which results in the death of the bone marrow tissue. And the bone marrow from the healthy donors, the bone marrow from the healthy donors is taken through an injection and replaced in these recipient bone marrows. This is what called as bone marrow transplantation. And bone marrow transplantation is usually done for leukemia, blood related diseases such as thalassemia, aplastic anemia, sickle cell anemia, multiple myeloma and also other certain immune def deficiency diseases. Or to say in short, hematopoietic stem cell bone marrow transplantation is mostly preferred for blood related diseases and blood related cancer. But there is one problem that lies in this bone marrow transplantation procedure. We have a recipient who is diseased and we have a healthy donor. The healthy donor should be of younger age. Old age donors are not preferred for this transplantation procedure. This was a major limitation on selecting the donors. Recently, as a result of research conducted in National Center for Cell Research, Pune, they have found a fantastic way that even an aged, a older hematopoietic stem cell can also be used for the transplantation procedure. So what is some background behind this research? This research found out a role of a very important cell called as stromal cell. What the cells are? Stromal cells are found in the micro environment of stem cells which results in supporting and supplementing stem cell function. So where there are stem cells, stromal cells are also found. And the stromal cells secretes some what is called as micro vesicles. These micro vesicles are very important for rejuvenating and keeping the longevity of the stem cells. But as, per, as individuals get older, stromal cells get destroyed and its ability to, dis, to synthesize the micro vesicles also comes down. This was found out in the research and by supplementing micro vesicles, even in a older stem cell, they have made possible that these older stem cells can also be used for transplantation. What would be the outcomes of this research? Now there is no limitation on the selection of only younger individuals, even older individuals can participate and donate their bone marrow. So this approach if standardized will expand donor cohort. So the availability of donor will now be more with this research and this rejuvenation, rejuvenation by the micro vesicles of stromal cells can be applicable not only for hematopoietic stem cell but also for other stem cells. And it also has a potential to improve the outcome of regenerative medicine therapy. So it has a great outcomes and potential uses makes it a very important improvement in the stem cell research. Thank you for watching this video. For more videos, subscribe to our online channel. Thank you.